So hello. Um, as the title says, um, the, what we do in this paper is to propose a new algebraic framework for um, studying decisional assumptions in M linear works, I, M linear groups, and I would like to start with uh, a disclaimer. So we're not saying that this model applies to the new recent um, candidate multilinear maps. Um, so the, we are um, studying um, M linear groups generically, and but our results do apply to standard bilinear groups. So the motivation for our framework is the observation, which is not ours and has been explicitly used in several works, that the, the Diffie-Hellman assumption can be seen, um, can be alternatively formulated as a problem of decided membership in a subgroup of G to the two. So on one hand, we have the, the standard formulation um, in which we are given a certain tuple and we have to decide whether these elements have certain relations within um, between them, and in another formulation, we're given this matrix A in the exponent, we're given G and G to the A, and another extra vector Z uh, in Z2, and we have to decide whether um, Z is in the image of A or not. And it's quite easy to see that these two formulations are equivalent, just write Z as uh, in the case that it belongs in the image of A as in this form, and then you'll see immediately that these two formulations are, are equivalent. The same hold, um, so first I will say that um, we, in these papers I will use uh, this bracket notation. So A in bracket stands for G to the A. And somebody in the coffee break told me that this was his favorite part of the paper. So, <laughs> so, so this notation is uh, extremely useful to highlight the algebraic structure of the assumptions that we will be studying. So bear in mind that A in brackets stands for G to the A, okay? Um, and so this algebraic formulation um, of the, um, also holds for the Tulin assumption. So that, as you know, the Tulin assumption was a, as an assumption that was introduced to compensate for the fact that the decisional Diffie-Hellman assumption is easy and symmetric bilinear groups. And it's in its standard formulation, um, so you will probably see it in the first formulation in which you are also given a certain tuple of elements and you have to decide whether they satisfy a certain relation. But it can also be formulated as this subspace membership problem in G to the three. So we have an, we are given this matrix A in the exponent, where A has two different elements in the diagonal and a last row of only ones. And we have to decide um, whether this vector in G to the three is in the span of A or not. And this holds for the K-Lin assumption, which is a, a, a generalization of the two-Lin assumption. And, um, which is a, and it, which is an assumption which is generically hard in um, k-linear maps, and it's, which is also interest, interesting because um, this provides a family of weaker assumptions. So two lean is weaker than DDH, and so on. So it's not only interested from a theoretical point of view, but also to have potentially uh, so weaker assumptions, okay? And again, um, in this case, we are given this matrix which has k different elements in the dia diagonal, then it has a last row of only ones, and we have to decide whether a certain vector of g, um, and g to the k plus one is in the image of A or not. This motivates us to introduce uh, this framework, the, which, which, uh, what we call the matrix Diffie-Hellman assumption, in which we say, um, the, the assumption says that if DLK is an efficiently sampleable distribution of matrices um, um, of size L times K, then these two, computational, these two distributions are computationally indistinguishable. So on one side, we have the matrix A concatenated with a random vector in the image of A, and on the other hand, we have A concatenated with a uniform vector in G to the L. So informally, what this is saying is that deciding membership in the image of A is hard. And of course, but what I just told you, the Kalin assumption is a special case of this assumption. So the research question that we um, tackle in this paper is what insights can be gained from this algebraic framework for decisional assumptions? So as we say, this observation that the Kalin assumption can be written in this way is not our observation, 
but what we do in this paper is exploit this algebraic point of view. And we get quite some results. So we first give new decisional assumptions. And what is especially nice about the result is that we get assumptions which are, have more compact description size. And this has an impact in practice for bilinear groups. We secondly characterize which distributions give rise to problems which are generically hard. And, which is, which, and the criteria for hardness that we give are quite nice, so and very mathematically formulated, and also surprisingly easy to use. I will come back to this. And then we also show applications of this matrix assumption. And basically, um, and we believe that almost everything that's, um, that you can construct from Tulin, you can also construct for this assumption. And what is especially nice about this is that you can instantiate many, inst you can give many instances of these primitives in a compact way. And finally, we give is an independent contribution, more efficient proof of memberships into spaces of G2DL, of equality and plain text, and of validity of ciphertext. Um, and this is done without introducing new computational assumptions. So maybe it's hard to see the relation of the last point with the, to the rest. I will try to make that clear later. But anyway, um, I first go to the new decisional assumptions. So the presentation time is short. And I cannot um, give everything that we have in the paper. We give several families of assumptions, several families of assumptions which are hard. So by families, I mean, um, again, like the Kaline parameterized by this K. And it's, it's like we keep families of weaker assumptions. Huh? But, um, and we also study relations with known assumptions like the K partite, Diffie Hellman, and so on. But for this talk, I will just tell you that we have these new assumptions, which we call the K symmetric cascade assumption, which um, has this shape, which is given by this matrix, which has A in the diagonal and then ones below the diagonal. And what is pretty cool about this new assumption is that, as you can see, to represent this matrix A, I only need um, two elements, which is independent of the size of K. Okay? So already for Tulin, this means I can save one element in the public key. This might be, not be a lot, but, but still this is achieved um, for free. So without um, losing security, at least we don't see why we would lose security. Okay? And as you, I will show you in the applications, the res, this representation side is an important parameter for applications. Okay, so bear in mind this k symmetric cascade assumption, which um, has a representation which is independent of k. Okay, then I, I go through the generic hardness results. Um, to, for the generic hardness results, um, we introduce this technical um, concept, which is what we call polynomial induced matrix distribution. Well, this is a very fancy name to basically say that um, this, we can an easy way to specify, a natural way to specify these distributions is by defining the ent entries of the matrices as polynomials in some variable A. That's exactly what we do here, but the, with the two symmetric cascade assumption, which is given by, um, as I said, the, the symmetric cascade assumption has some um, A's in the diagonal and ones below the diagonal. And in this case, the assumption is, is uh, defined by defining these polynomials. For instance, P1Y is simply the polynomial A, and so um, and the P12 is zero, and so on. And to sample an element from this distribution, we simply evaluate these polynomials at, at random. Okay, so this is just a fancy name to um, explain how to define this distribution. And for this type of distributions, we give two generic um, hardness criterions. A first one, which is sufficient and necessary conditions for generic hardness, which is very mathematically formulated in terms of equality of some ideals that have to do with these polynomials. I won't go into this. Um, and we second give a criterion um, which is with sufficient conditions for hardness when L equals K plus one. Um, this um, criterion has to do with the determinant of some matrix, um, of the matrix A, define it like this. And um, I cannot, I will not tell you uh, how it looks like exactly, but I will give you an example of how easy to use, is to use this criterion to prove the generic hardness of this K symmetric cascade assumption. Okay, so we define this polynomial um, that, um, D, which is the polynomial associated to the determinant of this matrix, which is simply the matrix A with some extra column Z. And well, this is some polynomial. 
And to check generic hardness, I, I look at two things. First, I look that um, to pr I, I try to prove that this polynomial is irreducible. To do this, our result says we just have to check that if the matrix has always full rank, regardless of the value of A, so look at the first K columns, and obviously the matrix does always have full rank. This tells us that the determinant is irreducible. And, we sec and then we apply the second criterion, which says if delta is irreducible, if all the polynomials are of degree one, which obviously is the case here because the polynomials are just A, one, and zero, and um, if the degree of the determinant is k plus one, so you just have to look at the leading term of the determinant, which obviously has degree, degree k plus one, then the assumption is generically hard in k linear groups. So with this, we are done. We just proved that this assumption is generically hard. Now um, I give you some, I will show some applications of this uh, uh, matrix assumption. So basic, in the paper, we, we give a public key encryption, hash proof system, gross high non interactive zero knowledge proofs, uh, pseudo random functions from any matrix assumption. The point is that um, we could give many more. Uh, and as I said before, um, actually, the, these constructions that we give are a generalization of the existing constructions for the K link case, and it's not hard to generalize them for any distribution. Okay, so basically, we think that almost everything that can be built for K-Lin can be built for any matrix assumption. And in particular, um, that's why it's pretty nice to have these compact assumptions, because um, if we have an assumption with smaller representation size, we also, this typically translates into more efficient constructions. Okay, for the K-symmetric, if we use K-symmetric cascades instead of K-Lin, we save K minus one elements in the public key, for the one and two, three applications for um, public key encryption, for instance, and k square elements in the secret key for the pseudo random generation, and so on. Okay, so, um, and as I said before, so we can give, um, we can easily prove, so if we mm, give an application for any matrix assumption, we are giving many instantiations of a given construction compactly. Okay, so it's practical to use these assumptions. Let me give you an example of how would public key encryption work. So we, I would, um, to the public key um, for public will, will be just a, a matrix A picked from this uh, um, distribution DLK. And um, the secret key consists of um, this matrix T, which I call the transformation matrix, which is A1 times A0. So I be, divide the public key into parts, okay? The upper part, which you assume to be invertible, and the second part, and this, the secret key is just this, um, is just this quantity that will allow me to transform um, some, the ciphertext, which is simply A0 times W into the secret key, okay? So, here we have C, so, sorry, so the ciphertext is C, which is A0 times W, and the encapsulation key will be A1 times W. To the creep, it's enough to multiply the ciphertext times the secret key, which is A1 times A0 minus one. Mm, it's obvious to, see, to check correctness, mm? and um, obviously semantic security follows directly from the matrix assumption which states that a times W is pseudo random. And as you can, you can see here, what I said before, that the description size of the public key crucially depends on the description size of the assumption that we're using. That's why it's interesting to use assumptions with more compact representation size. So now I go to the more efficient non-interactive zero knowledge proof for CRS, for common reference string dependent languages. The motivation for, this, uh, for the results in, the, in this section is the observation um, that although we have this gross high, um, mm, the gross high non-interactive zero knowledge proofs that allow to prove very general statements, so we can prove state, um, that a certain equation in uh, quadratic equation in bilinear group is satisfiable. In fact, in practice, we are using this. Um, these proof systems to, to give a proof for statements that are related to the common reference string or to the public key. 
So let me give you an example. We have this all but one threshold has proof system of Libert and Jung. And this is the tooling instantiation that they give in their paper. So what do we have? We have that the public key includes some matrix A, which is sampled according to the tooling distribution. And the ciphertext C is um, some, uh, so this vector um, C, which is a member, um, so a, a vector which is in the image of A, together with um, some gross high proof that C is correctly formed, so that C is indeed in the image of A. And this is, um, and the CRS, so that we use for this, um, for these gross high proofs, includes another copy of the ma matrix A and some other things. Okay, so our question is, can we exploit this dependency to get more efficient proofs? And indeed, we can. And so, um, and let me formulate the question. So this was for the um, um, all but one threshold hash proof system of um, Libert and Jung. But in general, the question is, we have this gross high common reference string where A is a matrix um, sample um, according to the DLK distribution. Okay, so this is what you, the natural generalization of gross high proofs to any DLK matrix assumption that we gave in the application section. And the question is, how do you prove that C is in the image of A? Um, and for this, we use, we exploit this dependency of the statement with the CRS. And well, this is technical, so this is for people who know about gross high proofs, but um, it's not hard to see that um, we have that C is in the image of A, even only if C is a gross a high commitment of the value zero. So the, we achieve these gains by um, simply showing that C is a commitment of zero, okay? So um, for, like this, we obtain new subgroup memberships um, proofs in the image of A, for A is a, a matrix sample according to DL, this DLK matrix assumption, since as we said, we generalize gross highs proofs for any DLK matrix assumption. So this is quite general. So these new subgroup, subgroup membership proofs are for um, any of these assumptions. The efficiency improvements depend on KNL. So they are not always, they do, we don't always improve on what you get directly using gross high. Um, but they are relevant in practice, I will show you now. And then this has just to show, just telling you that uh, this uh, proving membership in, in the image um, of A, so in a subgroup, in a linear, and so in a subspace of G to the L has many application in practice. So for instance, for the public key encryption scheme that I gave you before, if you want to prove that the ciphertext is the re-randomization re of another one, then you, are, you will have to prove um, membership in this image of A, okay? And for practice, um, what do our results mean? So we had this Libert and Jung example, and with this simple approach, we reduce the size of the proof from 12 to group elements. And the interesting thing is this is for free. So this means that we have the same security, we are based on the tooling assumption, and we are publishing no additional information, okay, by this observation. Um, so we have, um, we apply this idea, exploit this dependency, um, of the CRS and the statement also for plain text equality and for ciphertext validity, but I won't go into this. And I just um, conclude by saying that we think that this new algebraic framework um, provides useful insights both in theory and in practice. I think our talk demonstrates that. I encourage you to look at the paper because there's many results I could not um, explain. And the message that I would like to emphasize again, so it's important for people who do protocols and so on, we would like to suggest replacing the two-lean assumption by this two-symmetric cascade assumption, um, which, in which you save one group element, okay? M might not be um, a lot, but this is, this is for free. So this assumption is more compact and um, it has the same security guarantees. It, and it has the same security guarantees. And we also think it, you don't really lose functionality since we were able to translate um, all of these schemes for the tooling assumption to the um, two symmetric assumption. So that's all. <laughs>